Welcome to this evening's presentation of the API's Inside Story. This weekly magazine program highlights government's plans, programs, projects, and policies, and how they impact the lives of Vincentians. I am Ashisia Sam. Thank you very much for joining us on this week's edition. This week, we take you on a tour of the newly upgraded female surgical ward of the Milton Cato Memorial Hospital. The forestry department tells us of the challenges that they are confronted with during the dry season. The Richmond Vale Academy hosts an open day in commemoration of Earth Day 2017, and Nemo remembers the eruption of the La Soufrière volcano in 1979. Stay with us for this presentation. Mommy, we're busy right now. Just take a snack from the counter. No, Mommy. Those have too much salt in it. Can I have a fruit, please? That's an interesting choice. But where did you learn that? The people on Hellwood. No, Mommy. You want to kill me with high blood pressure? Hellwood says whatever salt you eat for the whole day should not be more than one teaspoon. And that is just for adults, you know. Foods may contain more salt than you think. Reduce salt intake. Welcome back to Inside Story. The Ministry of Health is upgrading a number of facilities at the Milton Cater Memorial Hospital under the Thent EDF project. The female surgical ward was among those upgraded. Recently, a team from the ministry toured the completed project, which, although in use at the moment, will be officially opened at a later date. Today is a very significant moment for us in that we are standing here in a brand new or refurbished female surgical ward, and we all know what it was like before. So we are very happy and elated to be here on this day. So we are simply here to actually mark a process where we will be returning the patients back into the female surgical ward. This is not the official opening of the completion of the refurbishment of the Milton Cato Memorial Hospital. That day will come. So I just want to repeat that. We are not officially announcing that the refurbishing project is completed and we are doing an official opening. No. Very soon, they will finish all of their works here and when that is completed, we'll be having a grand opening ceremony where we'll invite all the stakeholders and you all will be back here. Okay? So we are just here today to let you know that we are reopening the female surgical ward and then the patients will be moved back in here very soon. We will be having a very short, short one, and the minister will be giving us some address this morning, and after that, we can close. So let me ask the minister to come now and give us some brief remarks on this occasion. Minister. Thank you, PSN Chair, and thanks as well to everyone who is with us here this afternoon. And I think that we are here for a very important event in the development of our hospital services in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Because essentially, what we are here to commemorate is the fact that we have come a long way as far as this female surgical ward is concerned. You would know that we had to essentially merge the female surgical ward with the female medical ward way back in 2014, July. And as a result of that, we had some issues arising, principally issues to do with space, because there was no reduced bed space available for both those who are females in the medical section and in the surgical division. But I just want to make a point about the genesis of the idea in the first place. And, uh, it came out of an assessment which was done, a safe hospital assessment <coughs> spearheaded by PAHO, which indicated that a direct hit by a Category 1 hurricane, where well, they know there are five different categories of hurricane, one, two, three, four, five, depending on the wind speed. And the 
the lowest category is category one. And if we had a direct hit by that hurricane, or by a hurricane in that lowest category, it would have been enough to take off the roof of the female surgical ward. And there were other issues that had to really be addressed and rectified. And by all indications, we have been able to, to present for use by patients what I would consider to be a very modern facility. And modern is an operative word because we are here essentially because of the modernization of the health sector project. The modernization project funded by the European Union. And we know several of the other outcomes of this project. We know, for instance, that we, in December, were able to reopen the Mental Health Rehabilitation Center. And uh, in addition to several other aspects of this project, including aspects related to the construction of polyclinics, aspects related to training, there was a provision made for the improvement and upgrade of the hospital itself. And uh, in that, the provision for this improvement and upgrade was just over $5 million in the end. Just over $4 million of which came from the European Union itself, and there was counterpart funding from the government of St. Vincent of just under $1 million. So it was a collaborative partnership where we didn't rely entirely on external resources to get this done, but we put in resources of our own so that we could make it happen. Now, of that $5 million or so, dollars, a particular portion was allocated to taking care of the female surgical ward, to look after the intensive care unit, to look after the recovery room, and other areas as well. And this, I have been advised, cost us just over $1 million, and it was a worthwhile investment. In the period between July 2014, when we had to relocate, and uh, no, there was great inconvenience because of the merger. As I indicated earlier, space was a constraint. And people are breathing a lot easier now, I am sure, because we have some more space to work with. As I understand it, we'd have 24 beds in this area. And of course, it is a fluid situation, so we'd make assessments and see how we may need to, to vary the situation from time to time. But space was a problem. There was difficulty in terms of space for doctors who were going on their rungs. There was difficulty in terms of space for families who came to visit loved ones who were hospitalized. There were difficulties in terms of space for rest or relaxation or even an overcrowding of the communal areas by nursing and other staff. So we are happy that those challenges have now been resolved in the form of this facility that we have here today. Now, it is an important further step in our general strengthening of health services in St. Vincent. Just earlier this week, we had the handover of some ambulances. And of course, that is important. And these ambulances were, are going to be able to help us with our emergency medical services. And I know that, I'm, I feel, I'm quite sure that we will be responsible in the way in which we use and operate these ambulances so that we could satisfy the objective that we have in mind in responding effectively to emergencies. We also had this week a course in emergency care and treatment. So we are modernizing our approach all around. We, from time to time, may experience increasing demands or crisis situation, but we will never run away from a crisis. Why? A crisis is a period from which we emerge, and when we emerge, we are much more stronger and energize. We become a different person. Thank you very much and let's continue working hard and producing good work.
But likewise, we'll have to have. And it's good ventilation. Yes. And we have our fans, which we didn't have before. <laughs> <laughs> and we have our windows, which can now open, which was not there before. We had some old colonial windows with ropes that we used to pull and so on, almost resembling those church windows. <laughs> So now we Nothing have some, to <laughs> yes, yes. So this is our refurbished unit. We are very happy. We are indeed happy. And the nurses on the surgical unit cannot wait to be returned to our spaces for comfort for the nurses and the patients yeah. as well. well. Tomorrow. So God's willing, we are going to organize it for tomorrow. One of the things I'd just like to point out is that we have some beds here which were donated through the work of Council General Fitzgerald Huggins, who is in Canada representing the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. He, he sent some beds down to us. So it's really a collaborative effort. We have the project overall through joint funding from the European Development Fund and the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We have Council General Fitzhuggins working to make sure that we have some beds to populate the wards. So we have a really good collaborative effort. And I, I can't I would be, it would be remiss of me if I left out the fact that these, these rails were actually done by the maintenance department at the hospital here. So we are able to add nice finishing touches as well. So this is a, this is a wonderful project all around. It's going to contribute to better care for the patients. And we look forward to, to this new era of care. Thank you. Protecting our marine environment Our forests, our wildlife for our children Pollution of our rivers and beaches Deforestation and overfishing threaten to destroy our biodiversity Protected areas are set aside by law to protect these fragile ecosystems which provide us with water, food, electricity and recreation Tobago Keys Marine Park, Kingsville Forest Reserve and Milligan Key Wildlife Reserve are examples of our local protected areas Be inspired and help preserve what is naturally ours Let's Protected areas protect life. A message from the Environmental Management Department and the National Parks, Rivers and Beaches Authority. You're viewing Inside Story, a production of the Agency for Public Information. River poisoning, the debarking of trees and bushfires are some of the issues that the Forestry Department is confronted with during the dry season. These practices are not only illegal, but impact the sustainable use of our natural resources. Law Compliance and Enforcement Officer 3 of the Forestry Department, Bradford Latham, expresses the department's concern about these harmful practices and outlined the best practices that will encourage the sustainable use of our natural resources. We are here um, in Mesopotamia. Uh, where we have the, uh, recorded our first river poisoning. And this is one of the hot spots um, on St. Vincent and Grenadines where we, on an annual basis, do record river poisoning. Um, I am, we have a lot of compliance enforcement unit. Um, we do collecting data and we record like areas where certain activity, illegal activity, is highest and uh, this is one of the area um, on St. Vincent. We have um, other areas like in Vermont, we have um, last year we recorded um, in Rabuka area river and we always make that clear to the general public and persons to desist from um, engage in this illegal activity because it's really a very dangerous practice. The method now that have been used that we begging the public not to utilize is um, the use of chemicals um, to catch the, the crayfish. Um, this normally occurs around a time in the, when the, we are experience a drought. During this time, all of us, uh, the, the wildlife, do need water more. And the practice of um, persons, the few who will go and engage in contaminating and polluting the water. At this point in time of the year, it puts a lot of pressure on all of us. Um, 
with the, 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 the you know the, the persons who rely on the river for bathing, um, washing. Um, some persons still doing their river cooks is the same water they will they will utilize. And when you poison the river, the remains of these crustaceans um, when they decompose, and this is over a long period of time, it um, increases the bacterial load and pathogen in the water, which can cause a lot of illness um, among persons in the community. Um, animals that normally will be able to go to the river to drink, they won't drink because they will um, smell the decomposing, decomposition taking place in the water of the crustacean. So they will not drink the water. So you affect the agriculture, you affect the biodiversity in the, the streams where you have um, do a mass killing of many of these um, crustaceans and other species within within the, the rivers and streams. So it's a, a time of the year when we experience a short period of drought but additional pressure when we need the water the most. Persons who are engaged in um, fishing is to utilize the basket method. The use of the basket gives the creative opportunity for someone to able to be selective. They can be able to take the big ones and the very young ones they can be able to put them back for future uses. We in forestry we encourage sustainable use. When we talk about conservation we're talking about sustainable use of the, the natural resources that are very important to us. Um, the practice of poisoning is not sustainable at all in any way. Um, if many of us um, engage in this practice, we wouldn't have any crayfish left. Many of the aquatic species um, within the rivers and streams won't exist. And we are appealing to the general public to um, assist the forestry department um, and support us where persons who are going out and engage and if you have information of persons who are involved in the poison of rivers and streams they can come forward report it at um, the nearest police station and you can call the forestry department at 4578594 and you could ask to speak with any one of the officers because this practice is far-reaching and it's long-lasting um, the very few persons within the communities who are doing this, they are impacting on the resources and many lives greatly. Bushfires are also prevalent during the dry season. While farmers may have genuine reasons to light fires, the forestry department is imploring farmers to use the best methods in lighting fires on their farms. We didn't light fires at this point in time that you need, may need water now again to extinguish fire that um, may pose up to destroy um, life and property. So persons can lose their animals that they brought out to graze and you light a grass fire. We have experience where uh, recorded where persons have lost their, their animals that they have played put out to graze. One of the best practices that they can utilize is when they want to light a fire, make sure clear the area right around so that when you make your heap it wouldn't spread onto another area onto someone else's property and you must keep close by bucket of water or a, a beater something with a wet cloth or something like that um, that you could beat out any ember that is going to start a fire in an area that you do not want when you finish you make sure that the fire is put out so it was reignite <coughs> um, Another best practice, some persons when they want to light fires, make sure you could put in place what we call a fire trace on your property. Um, the slash and burn method is a, a, a method that is utilized by many farmers that um, it can be very difficult to control it because the amount of fuel that is available and with the wind you must be take into consideration when you're going to light fire if it's going to be very windy um, the condition of the material that is on the ground it is very dry um, and what you need to do if it's going to be the best time to light fire a lot of persons like to take the opportunity during the dry season
to burn up uh, or, or light the land to state their claim um, and take the opportunity to clear up a portion of land. But when you do this, you need to really take into consideration the amount of wildlife that is maybe living on that piece of land and that you cannot just light a fire and allow it to run. You will be posing a lot threat to the, the, the biodiversity, um, also to life and property of persons um, who live in around you. Like the poisoning of rivers and the lighting of bushfires, the debarking of trees is also another issue that the forestry department is confronted with during the dry season. Another practice, um, especially during the, the dry season, that we have um, persons who are going on, on, on a lot of picnics, right? and they want to go on a river line or the beach picnics um, around this time and they want to do their, their cooks. They go and they will debark trees, they will cut off material off of anyway and they like to go and light fires by the roots of trees. This um, practice is actually killing a lot of the, the, the trees. Um, when you choose that point at the root of trees to light fires. This sometime uh, weeks after that fire, sometimes do continue. It, it, it catch into the root of the trees. Um, sometimes it got the, the, these trees and will be burning for weeks. There, that same tree that you appreciated for shelter, right? Why you go there to picnic? You just killed it by lighting and setting a fire by its root. And in the end, you are unable to enjoy that um, the benefits of having a tree. When someone do that um, practice at the, the cooking at the trees, tree roots and um, causing that death of the tree in the end, it also a, a health risk that um, this tree can able to tumble later on and it may destroy um, lives and um, property because you went and born out there and cook at the root of the trees. So, picnickers, please uh, remember if you're gonna set up, you need to do it in an area that you're not going to destroy um, the trees. During the dry season, the species are thirsty and would be in search for water. Iguanas are one such species. Latham is imploring persons not to catch the iguana around this time during the dry periods, the wildlife are also affected. And one of these species that is greatly impacted during this dry season is the iguana. And this is a partially protected season, um, protected species, sorry. And um, when it, the, this, it is very dry, these animals will go out in search of, of water. And um, they will look for it within the drains, they will come within um, gardens and, and where you may have a, a, a pond or the feeding pans for dogs. They will go to those areas in search of water. Um, These the species are partially protected. They have an open and closed season. And currently we're in the closed season. The open season is from October until the end of January. And um, while these species, these iguanas, uh, other animals that are partially protected are in search of water, um, whether on your property or in the wild, you need to protect them. You're not supposed to hunt them. It's illegal to hunt them. So if it comes right into your yard, it is still free. So you're supposed to allow it to, to, to leave. If it is causing any problem to your um, property, you can contact us at the forestry department. So, while they are trying to survive, um, we are asking persons not to engage in the hunting and the taking of iguanas. Um, drivers, also we are asking them to be cautious when you see an iguana trying to cross the road, please allow it to pass. We have been observing, um, absorbing road kills of iguanas. So please allow them to cross the road because they are in search of water. Also, this is also the time that they will be also looking to lay their eggs. 
and um, that is why we have a close season for the species to also to to reproduce and develop and then we have the short period in which we're able to harvest so we all have to do our part to protect these species while they are in search of water and um, food a greener pasture so they may have to cross the road to get um, to get a food source so we are begging of the um, persons in St. Vincent and the Grenadines not to engage in the hunting of any of these um, wildlife species especially we're looking at the iguana um, that is mostly being imp uh, impacted around these times. This is one of the things we also appeal to the general public and farmers, um, fisher folks, not to cut trees and al allow them or leave them within the rivers and streams that is going to impede the movement of fish um, up and downstream um, where they are going to spawn. So it is illegal to cut and leave debris within the rivers and streams because this impedes the movement of fish to go upstream to spawn and able to make it back um, to the lower part of the rivers. This practice um, we do see it that it may happen as a result of storms but we also see where persons deliberately cut um, trees and leave them across the, the rivers when also when the rainy season comes in place and we have flash floods these um, objects and debris may cause the river to overflow its bank and cause additional damage to infrastructure because it caused the river to change its course. So the cutting of and leaving of debris and the cutting of trees and leaving of debris within the rivers and streams, we appeal to the general public to desist from this. We, if you need assistance um, for cutting of trees, you can call the forestry department and there are also a lot of private practitioners um, around that you can ask. Um, and they are also affordable. You can be able to contact us at Forestry Department at 4578594, where we can be able to uh, professionally cut these trees and remove the logs and the debris from uh, the rivers and streams. The Forestry Department is charged with the responsibility of protecting and conserving all the natural resources of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The department takes its role very seriously. Thus, anyone found guilty of any of these offenses, which threatens the sustainable use of our natural resources, will not be spared the consequences. For someone who is engaged in um, poison of rivers, that person can be charged up to $2,000 or six months imprisonment. And this is something that we are ready and willing to enforce. We do need the support of um, the community to be able to um, be a witness unless we get all the evidence that is available to take this matter before the court. And we are very serious about this. Uh, the department, we do have an approach in terms of educating the public. Education is first. We like to go to the public and let them know what we are doing. And we, we like to support the farmers, all the community folks in what they need to do. Um, our first approach is not to arrest and charge. Forestry officers do have the powers to search, arrest, and um, we'll bring them before the police where they will be laid, the charges will be laid. This is not our first try, but for repeated offenders and where areas that is, um, we have in that repeated offense that is happening now, over a period of time, we are not going to tolerate it anymore. We want to bring a stop to it, so we are appealing to persons within the community to come forward. Um, being quiet about it, um, doesn't really save us. It's actually been detrimental to ourselves, our children, and those to come. So we need all to play our part to protect 
the country that we are living in and the natural resources that we need. We all need um, water. We need to continue to make sure that our rivers and streams are flowing. So we have to protect our trees. We have to protect the water and, and the resources that are within it. Because they also serve as a, a food supplement for many. And the land space. Because when we do burning over a period of time, we end up losing our fertile topsoil. And this we call land degradation. You keep burning over a period of time, the vegetation type would, would change and this will cause the species that will be able to grow there to change and then we start to experience a lot of rock outcrop and then you start experiencing landslides, rock falls, especially on the leeward side of the island where we have um, persons involved in a lot of lighting of fires because of the fear of wildlife species. We do not have any poisonous snakes here. And we know where we have reports where persons have seen a snake and burned down a whole area because of seeing one snake trying to kill it. Which is also an offense. All of our snakes are totally protected species. We want, um, we know of persons who may have engaged in, in lighting of bushfires to harvest yams. This is also illegal. So to clear up a land, burn down a whole area just to, for you to harvest yam, this is also an illegal practice. So from area to area, we recognize that persons use fires to, to, for their own convenience, being lazy, and uh, then destroying many of on a large scale um, of our resources. As a result, want to use the easy method out, but that is very detrimental to us. The aim of the forestry department is to get all Vincentians to appreciate our natural resources and to play a part in protecting these resources. When we come back, we join the Richmond Vale Academy on its open day celebration for Earth Day 2017. Do stay with us. <laughs> Natural history includes the long-tailed white tropic birds that migrate to our skies and rock faces, the North Atlantic humpback whale that comes to our warm waters to give birth to and nurse their young, the critically endangered hawksbill turtle and the St. Vincent parrot. These are all creatures that the National Trust seeks to protect for future generations. For more than 40 years, the National Trust has worked to save St. Vincent and the Grenadines' most beloved places, landscapes and seascapes where great moments of history took place. We work together with communities to value and protect important pieces of our cultural community, national history and environment, such as the series of decorated Salvador pots found in Clare Valley, signifying that St. Vincent's civilization is almost 2,000 years old. We do this all because the next generation needs to know our stories, as they will only inherit the places and species we choose to save today. We urge you to plant a tree under whose shade you never plan to sit. Join the National Trust today. Earth Day is observed today, April 22nd. It is a day when more than one billion people celebrate planet Earth. In St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Richmond Vale Academy, an institution that supports environmental protection and aims to train activists from different countries to fight global warming and global poverty where most needed, hosted an open day on April 15th to help raise awareness on the importance of protecting our environment. The Richmond Vale Academy marks Earth Day with a number of activities, one being an open day held on April 15. Members of surrounding communities, farmers groups from across the island and other interested individuals spent the day at the academy, exploring as well as in sessions organized to heighten awareness of the importance of organic farming and supporting local as well as sustainable development. Minister of Economic Planning and Sustainable Development, Honorable Camilla Gonzalez, gave a presentation on the change in concept of development over the years. From the mid-80s, there was, there was an Earth Summit in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, 
1992. And they really drilled down on what do we want this sustainable development thing to be. And the international community agreed for the first time, really, on a lot of principles of sustainable development. And a couple of them, I'll read a couple of them, because they'll tell you from 1992 where we are in St. Vincent and the Grenadines today and where we hope to be you know, 10, 15 years from now. So in the Rio conference, they said, human beings are at the center of concerns for sustainable development. They are entitled to a healthy and productive life in harmony with nature. And it sounds obvious today, but that was a radical change of view from what existed before. Human beings at the center of development? No. The economy is at the center of development. The value of your assets is at the center of development. Your economic growth is at the center of development. And if in growing some money runs down to you, well, great. But you are not at the center of development. And the idea that you should be in harmony with nature was also a radical departure in development economics and de development thought. Development before was, you'd look at this and you'd say, what can I build here? You'd look at a mountain, you'd look at a forest, you'd look at a beach, you'd say, what can I build here? Not, can I have something in harmony with nature? Concrete was development, steel was development. Um, nature was something to be developed. So that was a very radical departure. He also mentioned the UN Sustainable Development Goals and its relation to some of government's policies. And the Sustainable Development Goals are a set of 17 goals that every country in the world got together and agreed on about things that define sustainable development. There are 17 goals, and if you, if you Google it, if you go online, you look up the sustainable development goals, you'll see the 17 goals, and if you click on each goal, it will tell you all of the targets that each goal encompasses. So just to recite them briefly, no end poverty, zero hunger, their goals related to good health and well-being, to quality education, to gender equality, to clean water and sanitation, to affordable and clean energy, to decent work and economic growth, to innovation and infrastructure, to reducing inequality, to sustainable communities, to responsible consumption and production, to climate action, and we'll talk a little bit about climate change and climate action, to life in oceans and rivers, and to peace and justice and strong institutions. So listen to all of the things that came into the mix for development. Before it was, is your economy growing? Now they're saying, are men equal to women? Do you have quality education? What's going on in your oceans? Are your cities sustainable? How are your consumption practices? Are you recycling? None of these things were part of the developmental conversation um, in the past. And that's what the Sustainable Development Goals has put on the front burner. The government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines um, has been engaged even before 2015 in sustainable development or in their idea of sustainable development. Um, but this was such an exciting development, this, this global consensus around what sustainable development was, that the government adopted these 17 goals and place them at the center of our policy and our developmental policy. Senator Sherlan Zita Banwell, a strong advocate for organic farming, was the other presenter at the day's session. Senator Banwell highlighted the importance of organic farming, noting the dangers of the consumption of imported foods. For me, sometimes it seems like a very romantic idea that once you're buying something that's locally produced, that it's going to be a healthier option. And that is mostly true. But 
there's some practices, farming practices that we have that, like Minister Kamala has said, that we need to revisit, that we need to do some re-engineering when it comes to agriculture and while we produce our food here. Um, I've practically been one of those recipients of farming and agriculture. My father was um, a die-hard farmer before he passed on. I, he started with um, bananas and then they, when we diversify away from there to other root crops. And I'm one of those persons who can say proudly that agriculture did me good. It sent all of us, like he said before, to school and build homes. And so everybody can benefit from, if you have a local vibrant economy in agriculture, how the spill-off effects to improving the lives of everyone. Fruits and vegetables that we import contain wax and fungicides and things that are prevented from rotting. And most of these things are what we call now, everybody should be familiar, carcinogen, leads to cancer. Um, the food that we import have little or no nutrients at all in them. Um, they have higher content of sodium. And as I said before, they are likely to contain pesticides and um, fungicides artificial flavoring, artificial sweeteners, uh, more likely to contain genetically modified um, um, as, um, elements, and I know this is something that's there to Stina, we have talked about this before in terms of where we go with genetically modified organisms in St. Vincent and the grenadines. The poultry, the meat that we import are more likely to contain hormones and antibiotics, and as I said, most of these things are carcinogens. So, what are some of these illnesses? You know them. The Academy is managed by Stina Hegberg. She has been organizing these activities annually, but according to her, this year was special because of the choice of presenters. Well, I choose uh, Camilo Gonzalez because I was very happy last year when the, we got a Ministry of Sustainable Development, or that was just a specific umbrella, because before it was under the Ministry of Health and Environment. So I thought that was a very good step for uh, promoting a more sustainable future. And obviously to get the minister to come is always an honor. Then uh, Ms. Barnwell, I have been in contact with several times in regards to the importance of growing, eating and buying local, and we have had some joint campaigns on really pushing for local products and more healthy living. So uh, that's why we were very happy to invite them and they both said yes, so that was wonderful. I see there's a much broader knowledge, there's much more interest and then of course I can see that the government is really doing well in terms of pushing renewable energy, so that's going really well and I think there's a lot that's been done for disaster reduction and disaster management and I think in, in terms of organic farming and sustainable farming I think we have some outstanding examples in St. Vincent but there's a lot to do so I think uh, uh, at least I hear many more people contact us these days because we do biogas people call and say so how, we, well, we actually did that and some we had something that doesn't work and how do you actually make compost and people come to see how can you actually farm organic and so I see there's a lot more questions a lot more interest and uh, we have also been able to get more sponsorship like right at this moment when you have visited us today we have a youth group here with 12 youth from England and 12 youth from St. Vincent and they have been sponsored by the Mystic Charitable Trust and the David Ross Education Foundation. So we also see that we get more sponsorship, which helps us to do what we like to do. St. Vincent and the Grenadines is making progress in environmental preservation. Activities like these, where people can interact with nature and each other, as well as acquire knowledge on such an important topic, is always welcomed. In terms of things that you guys are doing um, well, um, I think that uh, there's a lot of engagement here um, by the people and by the government um, to, to adapt to climate change. Obviously there's a lot of motivation because of the incredible effects that you are already experiencing here. So I'm really happy to see how active people are and um, how concerned people are and that they are actually doing something about it. Some of the things that we put on our skin, some of the things that we eat are actually detrimental to our health. So if we start there with that consciousness, um, you talked about health, um, beauty and fashion, and it is true. The products that we use on our skin, even the regular lotion, contains chemicals that are carcinogen and uh, we call hormone disruptors. Um, they're also not in terms of cancers. If we tell our young people that, almost immediately they say, ah, you have to die somehow, you know? But I think over time, 
we ourselves have to practice and let the young people know we don't want to see these things, we model the behavior, and once you model the behavior for them, and you see, well, I can still be beautiful, I can still look well, I can feel well about myself, then they too will try to adopt those practices. To me, I feel happy about it, and I think this school is gonna cry me farther than where I reach, and I appreciate it, because I learn a lot about the garden, and like chemical stuff, and organic, so that's, it's very interested. I've been thinking about how we could have maybe a more um, or organized effort to invite different church groups here. We've had some and uh, we're trying a more organized approach to get, have schools visit us systematically because we have a school visitation program and we have had several farmers group but we still know that there are many more farmers group who didn't come. So I'd like to see um, both what we can do get more people to visit us but also that people can contact us and say well we are a group of five can we come? We're a group of 20, can we come? And what can we learn about? We would specifically like to learn about renewable energy, or we'd like to learn about herbs, or we'd like to learn about gardening, or all of it. Uh, so I think in that way I'd like to see uh, people, they are welcome to contact us anytime for tours and see what they can learn from here. And um, then I hope that we could get to work more with the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Education in terms of sharing the importance of why organic farming is good for us. Do you remember what transpired on April 13th, 1979? Still with us, you'll find out when Inside Story returns. Thirty-two islands and keys are waiting to be discovered. Take a look at us now. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Caribbean you're looking for. On April 13th, a number of Vincentians were busy preparing for Easter weekend and more than likely were too occupied to remember the 1979 eruption of the La Soufre volcano. This presentation that you're about to view takes us back to the events of 1979. And then you see the big smoke tumbling over the hill. Big ball of smoke tumbling over the hill. Then after that you start to see fire. And a thunder crack. I thought the whole earth opened. And then I went and I woke up my sister. I said, girl, wake up, wake up, wake up. Sufre erupting. Sufre erupting. And then he called out, Rosal people, Sufre erupt. And everybody asleep. Sufre erupt. The older people said that it erupted uh, in 1902, somewhere there. They told us about the sea, how it became hot, and how fishes were coming out of the water. And it caused so many lives and damages to crops, livestock, etc. So I expect a lot of things will happen with this one. On the 13th of April, 1979, which was a Friday, I was traveling from Bali to North Leeward. Well, 1979 was an actual, uh, was an active duty at the Central Police Station in Kingston. In 79, I had just started to teach in 78. At the time the Sufre erupted, I was on holiday. School was on vacation. Early in the morning, I got up with my first son, Don to start the baking. 
Suddenly, I heard something like a thunder. So I turned to my wife. I said, Evelyn, girl, you look like a bad Good Friday. <laughs> That's a good Good Friday. That's a bad Good Friday. Meanwhile, the lightning was flashing and the thunder we thought was rolling. So I said, thunder rolling on Good Friday? No, nah, that have to be suffering. The inspector was on duty, Carlos, and said that there seemed, there's, he just got a report from Richmond that the volcano had been erupted. So I got up and I rushed out, and when I looked up over the mountain, I saw these black clouds rolling over, tumbling over. And then, then all of a sudden, people start feeling like little powder dropping on top of them. When I come out, I saw somebody coming down on the street. And they said that to me, they said, um, Philip, buy a shroud, you know. And like, you should afraid going to Europe. And when I look out my door, I see the ashes started to fall. I call my children. The whole place became almost dark. And when we looked out, we could see ash falling. I saw vehicles and individuals walking towards me. We asked the question, what happened? They say the suffering erupted. At about 9, 10 o'clock, the ashes started to fall heavy. Even a guy was going up the road with a uh, jeep. He had to punch out the wind scream to see to go up the hill again. Well, it was a sad moment and we feel that the country was going to separate from <laughs> into two. <laughs> Rumors that the, the island would be split in two or it disappear. I believe they were thinking about Krakatoa. I'm not quite sure, but um, possible maybe. When our parents realized that the volcano was erupting, they put us to sit down, explain what it was, told us we had to stay together. But the many persons around us just ran out of their houses and started running. Then after that, you start to see fire in the cloud, fire pitching in the cloud. People yeah. get scared. Yeah, so people get scared. The volcano made me feel very scared because that was my first experience of an eruption. And Don started to tremble. I said, boy, everything would be all right. Here's where we conclude this week's presentation of Inside Story, the API's weekly magazine program. Join us again next Saturday for our next presentation. I'm Ashisi Assam. Do have a wonderful weekend.